Welcome to the start of Grind. Happy New Year, guys. All right, awesome. Well, we're very glad that you guys can make it out tonight. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Brian Park. I'm actually the uh, the start of Grind chapter director here in DC. So, uh, is it too low? All right. Okay, okay. Go, go, Brian. Uh, so, um, so basically, what Startup Grind is is that uh, we are an organization um, that's basically for founders by founders, and um, we actually started in Silicon Valley by Derek Anderson. Uh, it actually started with nine entrepreneurs, and it kind of slowly grew into more of a formal meeting every month. And uh, basically, uh, it's gr it's grown very quickly to about 40 chapters all over the world. So, um, and, and really what they do is, these chapters will bring in local tech titans, uh, and actually it doesn't have to be tech titans, they're, they're actually founders in the local areas of their, you know, of their perspective area. Um, they actually will bring them out and, you know, just ask about their finding, you know, their founding days of their startup. Um, you know, basically what, you know, they learned, what were the successes, their failures, and uh, what they would do differently. So, you as a entrepreneur can, Go back to your startup and contribute uh, whatever you learn. So, um, so basically, uh, we we have a monthly meeting. Um, our tonight's guest is a very um, special person. Um, I'm sure you guys have have heard of him. He's actually um, the founding president of Hello Wallet. For those who haven't heard of Hello Wallet, Hello Wallet is a kind of like a Mint.com for enterprise. So. Uh, how many of you are like enterprise st st startups here? Okay, how many of you are like consumer internet? All right, okay, cool. Now we're gonna be talking about this, so, and you know. <clears throat> so basically, uh, our guest, uh, he actually, uh, you know, back in 19, I'm sorry, 2009, he started Hello Wallet with the uh, uh, founder, Mike Fellows. And uh, you know, he's he's been able to uh, capture uh, funding from Steve Case and GrowTech um, funds. And so it's just real, really excited to hear what, what he has to say about that. Um, and actually, before Hello Wallet, um, he's actually uh, responsible for $40 billion of IPOs, of household names that you guys use. So that includes, you know, IHOP, um, Home Depot, Starbucks, yeah, Starbucks guys, right? Uh, McDonald's, Amazon.com, and Infosys. So, so excited to have him here tonight. So, uh, as a before we introduce him, I, I just want you guys to know that we have a startup grind tradition, and we ask everyone to kind of rise and give a big shout, right? Just give a big cheer. So we're gonna do a little practice round. So, you guys willing? Okay. All right, a little practice, okay? Okay. So, ready? So. Uh, when I when I introduce you guys, all right, rise and give you know a big cheer. So here we go. Uh, just just clap your hands. No golf no golf claps. Okay. Okay, ready. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Join me in welcoming Rebel Horsey of Hello Wallet. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know. Wait, wait. Okay, wait, wait. It was it was it was good. A little bit more cowbells. So let's try it again. Ready? 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 Ladies and gentlemen. Join me in welcoming Horse uh, Rebel Horsey. Okay. Okay, 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 good, good, okay. Oh, no, we got that. Okay, great, awesome. All right, we're gonna be doing that a couple of times in the next few weeks. So um, before we bring him again, uh, I wanted to want you guys. I want to remind you guys to sign up. Okay, um, go to startup startupgrind.com. Okay, and sign up on our website. Okay, meet up so you can get tonight's video taping, and also notifications for um, the future um, speakers. So, you guys ready? Yes. Ready? Yeah. All right. I'm ready. All right, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Rebel Horsey of Hello Wallet. Wow. That was, that was impressive. There's yeah. a... Like, there's a national championship football game starting in about an hour, right? Uh, you usually get that kind of uh, applause in the everybody morning. Everybody is primed, yes. Okay, yes. awesome. Yeah, exactly. You, when you put some coffee in the morning, you're all like, get that, you yeah. have your cheering section there? That's a, particularly when you price a hot IPO. Everybody <laughs> loves you, you know? Yeah. 
So actually, Rebel, uh, we're really excited to have you here because actually it was very strategic to bring you here tonight. Um, in, for, in front of all the other speakers that we had lined up, and we've got some pretty big speakers. Yeah. But you're, I mean, you're a pretty big one too, but don't get me wrong. But uh, we wanted to bring specifically Rebel because um, as we usher in the new year, 2013, um, what better person can talk about 2013 than Rebel Horse? Come on, don't be, you're, you're a little bit too modest there. I mean, basically this guy, you have been in the startups side and then you've been on the capital market side. And, uh, and I've heard you speak in the, you know, about maybe two years ago. I'm like, wow, this guy is awesome. So I'm so glad you're our guest tonight. So well, with that setup, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, we just want to, uh, as a usually what we do is we um, start off on a personal note. Right. So um, we we want to ask about your background. What did you do? Where did you grow up? What did your parents do? Um, you have siblings. Your favorite siblings. <laughs> All right, here we go. So let's do that. Yeah. Sure. Listen, I. I is that me? Um, I, uh, I made some notes, but I'll try not to refer to my notes too much. At least I don't need to refer to my notes if I'm thinking about my upbringing. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I, I think I can remember that part. Uh, Your mom remembers that. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I grew up not far from here. I grew up in, um, in Dover, Delaware. Dover, Delaware. And um, um, youngest of uh, five kids. And uh, my father, uh, who is still alive at the age of 89, uh, was a uh, Supreme Court judge for many years, and uh, my mother was uh, did a, an odd eclectic bunch of different things, never involving making a dime. Um, and uh, I guess the only thing that's really formative about that growing up experience is I was the youngest of five kids, and by the time I was born, um, my father was working way too hard. He wasn't really around very much, and my mother had pretty much checked out of being a parent. And so I was kind of off on my own. Um, and so, uh, yeah. yeah. A little picky syndrome there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so why don't you, like, uh, tell us about um, your, maybe your first job. I mean, here's, here's Rebel, like, you know, he's the IPO guru. You know, he's putting billions of dollars in the IPO market. What was your first job, like, that really taught you the value of money? I'd say, you know, it's funny you asked, like, when you sent over the questions. My first job that taught me the value of money was... Um, had to, to have been when I was uh, uh, 13 years old, um, and I got a job illegally working as a uh, pot washer. This is on tape, you know that, right? Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> as a pot washer at a Syrian Mideastern restaurant in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. And I worked uh, about 65 hours a week, making a do dollar fifty an hour, about 15 an hour, which I thought was a king's ransom back then. And, um, and it, it taught me very much about the value of money. Wow, did you, did you have like, uh, you know, the typical American jobs such as like, you know, lawn mowing, lawn mowing, snow plowing or snow shoveling and oh, no, playing no. piano at the mall? That was my job. I, I, was, a, I was a pot washer. Oh, you're a pot washer? I was a pot washer. Okay. Yeah, a pot it washer, was, guys. It was, it was pretty brutal stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, it, it gave me a really great appreciation for, um, um, for the restaurant business and I ended up um, you know, taking a lot of restaurant companies public, and, and so it, it, it's kind of not that I that was there was no clear vision. But I was sitting there washing those pots, right? You're like one but of these days. <laughs> uncanny how I found myself 20 years later, you know, taking Cheesecake Factory public, or you know, or Sonic Burger, or International House of Pancakes. Wild. So that was awesome. Okay. Well, um, did you like? Did you have like a favorite? teacher or did you have like a mentor growing up? Um, I know it's kind of hard because you pretty much have four other siblings just beating you down every day and it's, it's kind of hard to... Yeah, no kidding. So what, I was six foot seven when I was born. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's like slowing me down. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I actually, I did have a, um, uh, my, a I, in, um, I, went away, I went away to a boarding school and uh, I had a uh, there were two people who were particularly important to me in my boarding school experience. One was a, um, a uh, he was a guy who was not a teacher in the classroom, but he was a coach, and he was uh, he was my advisor uh, my freshman year, and uh, and I was hopelessly I skipped the eighth grade going into high school, which was really a mistake, but I did that anyway. So um, I was a thirteen year old ninth grader off in a boarding school. You should never do that to your 
child. Never, ever do that to your kid. Um, and, uh, but this guy, uh, Chuck Vernon, he, uh, he came into my room uh, like every third or fourth day, and he was, it was clear that I was drowning. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? And he, he gave me a really great lifelong lesson, which I've, I still always apply, which is basically, you know, this was before the computer, before I was kind of crap. And he took out a little index card, and he said, you know, Rebel, what I want you to do is um, every, every morning when you wake up, I want you just to make a little list of the 10 things you're going to accomplish today. Just make that little list of 10 things you're going to accomplish today. And then as you go through the day, check them off, right? And then at the end of the day, you can feel a sort of sense of accomplishment, and you can sort of I, you know, circle things that you need to come back to. Anyway, seems like a really simple lesson, but for a 13-year-old kid, it was a really important lesson. Um, the other person was um, my econ teacher, who was... Uh, What's his name? Or he? he, he his, well, his name is Jim Wilson. His, um, his nickname is Grim. His nickname is Grim. All right. Um, and, which is kind of funny because he's, there's nothing grim at all about him. But he was a wonderful teacher, and uh, and he actually his um, I mean he, he one of his um, other students who's, who's done much better than I ever did in my career was a guy named Henry Kravis, who you know founder of KKR. Um, um, but but Grim was just a, 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 a incredibly passionate and uh, um, just instilled a lot of uh, excitement. And I, I for years I would go when I was working on Wall Street I'd go back every year and teach um, teach Grim's class. Wow, that's awesome! That's great. Wow, I talk about giving back, so that's yeah. that's really awesome. So let's um, let's kind of go in the beginnings of Hello Wallet. Um, I know that uh, you know, kind of tell us like how did you meet Mike Fellows, uh, and you know, kind of tell us the whole story. How were you guys introduced? Like, was he like, you know, was he like a golfing buddy, or was he? Did you meet him at church, or did you meet him at clubbing or something? I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's it's not. Well, it's a it's a. I guess it's a sort of an unusual story. So it's it's Matt Fellows. It's Matt, not Mike. Uh, oh, so I that's right. Didn't scratch that. Sorry. Uh, so I, I met Matt. Uh, I was introduced to Matt by his parents, uh, and I got to know Matt's parents because when I uh, retired from my first career in investment banking, I moved my family to Paris um, to spend two years living in Paris. And uh, just to do a cultural immersion, I wanted my kids to have that experience of living uh, in a foreign country. And, um, and I got to know Matt's parents, who were living in Paris at the time, through a, a social connection. And when I moved back to the Bay Area, because I'd been living in, out in San Francisco for about uh, 10 years before moving to Paris, then I moved back to the Bay Area. Um, and uh, Matt's dad, um, his name is, his name is uh, his Peter Fellows, uh, Peter said, you know, my son is at Brookings. He's, uh, he's been doing a lot of research in the area of consumer finance. Uh, he's trying to figure out sort of what he wants to do next. He's got this sort of entrepreneurial itch. Uh, would you be willing to spend some time with him, meet with him, and talk a little bit about uh, you know, what you've done and how he can maybe sort of think about the you know, different paths? Uh, and I, of course, I said fine. And so uh, in, it was probably in the winter of 2007 that Matt and I first met. I was, uh, I was again, living in San Francisco. He was in D.C., but he was out for a conference or something, and so we first met. And Matt described for me sort of the, the um, kind of the kernel of the, sort of the research that he had been, do been doing in the area of consumer finance uh, and the uh, sort of fair pricing and uh, availability of consumer, of um, you know, consumer financial products for you know average people, um, and and the bottom line is that it's not a it's not a level playing field. Uh, and we're not talking about investment products; we're just talking about basic deposit products, credit products. Uh, and he said, you know, I, I um, you know we've done this research; it's not a level playing field. There is one path, which is to go sort of the, the policy path of trying to sort of fix the problem, um, but you know that's like death by a thousand cuts. And so maybe we, sh you know, I, I, I'd like to think about going a sort of an entrepreneurial route. Could we build a company that would allow us to sort of tackle this problem? Was this was this idea like uh, was it kind of like um, I, I know that that there was support from the Brookings, I mean the Rockefeller Foundation. Was that kind of like an offshoot of that, yeah. or I mean? So what what we did is as we sort of hatched the idea, and you know, and like any idea, you know, it it, it goes through iteration after iteration of formulation and reformulation. Uh, and the, the, so I'll start with the sort of the basic mission of the company, which is to democratize access to financial guidance for all Americans. Democratizing access to financial guidance. Uh, why is that important? Well, it's important because when I mean, you think about back in the, the mid-1950s, the first credit cards 
uh, were dropped in mailboxes in um, Fresno, California by a little bank called Bank of America. And um, Former employee. I, I worked for B&A, yeah. And, um, um, and, and what, what, what then ensued over the next 50 years was this dramatic d democratization of the accessibility of credit products, in particular credit products, because that's where all the, you know, that's where all the damage was done. Uh, so democratization of, in terms of access to credit products to everybody, right? So you point, find a person who doesn't have a credit card in their wallet. Uh, but there was no parallel or, or um, um, you know, commensurate democratization in terms of uh, the sort of education and the, uh, and the um, um, sort of intelligence that needs to go along with arming people with these products. And so, and that, that's kind of the, that was the basic um, disconnect that we identified, which is to say, okay, all the banks had given all these consumers all these products that they can use to get themselves in trouble, but they actually haven't really provided the tools so that people understand what the hell are they doing with all these products. And, you know, and, you know 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, you know, you know, there, there were classes like home economics in school where you learned about like budgeting and financial planning and how to I mean, how I, you know, my first checkbook, right? You know, you had the register, you kept track of how much money you had, and you know, you know, you didn't overdraw your account. You just didn't, it just didn't happen, right? Um, and and so, you know, the, the the basic premise of Hello Wallet is basically to say, okay, how do we fix this problem? How do we provide people with a, um, you know, with the with you know what I'll call day-to-day -day financial planning. Not investment management, but day-to-day -day financial planning. And so we went, we took that idea to the, to the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and the Rockefeller Foundation, they cared about that idea because um, they had been doing some work and some research in this area of trying to help um, uh, lower income families um, develop some you know, financial um, acumen, basic financial acumen. And they, and they liked the idea of trying to develop a technology platform that would do that. Uh, and so we went to Rockefeller and, uh, they, and they gave us a, uh, roughly a million dollars as a seed grant. Um, and what was quite remarkable about it was that you know, this was a grant from the, a foundation, so there was no... I mean, they, they knew that you were going to be a for-profit. Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay. And so this, there, there, there was no exchange of equity. They just gave us the money. And in return, we said, okay, we're going to build this product um, and then we will commit to delivering a certain number of subscriptions to community organizations. And they identified two community organizations, one of them called the Community Builders and the other one um, called the Center for Economic Progress out in Chicago. Uh, and so we, we uh, agreed that we were going to build a platform and we were going to give a certain number of, sus of subscriptions in, you know, in, 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 in exchange for um, the, the, the million dollars. So is that caveat still you know, in existence? So you, that's we had talked about the whole social impact and the double bottom line. That's still part of uh, Hello Wallet, and is that so one of the things you have to maintain? As? Well, so so we 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 made that commitment to Rockefeller, um, and I should just to back up. I decided when I left investment banking that the future of my career and how I wanted to engage um, was going to be very much driven by a commitment to um, to. Uh, social mission, and so I, and that's one of the reasons why I teamed up with Matt was because I said, wait a minute, this is a clear social mission. Uh, we're fixing a basic problem in society, and the opportunity to find um, intersections for a for-profit and non-profit, right, where you can actually like have purpose and profit that coexist and can thrive. That's the place I want to be. That's the piece of real estate that I want to. I want to own. Um, we took the Rockefeller idea to Bill Clinton, um, and uh, because the Clinton Global Initiative, um, it, it, what happened if you think back to to, to 2008, uh, you know the um, uh, Clinton had been focusing all of his fo all of his attention, his foundation's attention, for, for the most part, looking outside the United States. They were doing a lot of stuff in Africa, right? They were beginning to do some stuff in Asia. Very little stuff in the United States. And then you had the economic tsunami that hit, right, in 2008. And there was clearly a lot of, you know, a lot of damage, a lot of destruction here in the U.S. And so Clinton said, you know, we really need to bring some focus to addressing rural problems in the United States. And so he 
heard about us. We met with them, and he said, I love what you guys are doing, and so I want to unveil you at the Clinton Global Initiative. So in September 2009, we had our unveiling. We, but we didn't have an application yet. We had a splash page. We didn't even have really a website. It was a little embarrassing. We had a launch page. A launch page. Launch page, sign up. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it was it was bizarre because I was uh, I was out in uh, in California watching watching um, Larry King live interview interview Bill Clinton on the eve of uh, of CGI and, uh, and 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 Larry said so you know Mr President uh, tell us t can you can you share with us some of the exciting companies that you're you're going to be unveiling and, and and Bill says well I want to tell you about Hello Wallet and I was like thinking really did he really <laughs> say that. <laughs> That's absurd. That's awesome. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, okay, so that's that's a good segue because uh, you know now you have Bill Clinton kind of like endorsing you guys. You know, tell us a little bit about you know when you were um, raising uh, the the Series A or you know more specifically Steve Case um, and Grotech. So like, how did that introduction happen? I mean, how how did how did you you know get well, Steve to Sure. To invest in you guys, and how did he hear about you? I mean, what did Bill says? Hey, you know, you know, Steve. No, Bill had say that, or was he, it? he had nothing, nothing to do. Oh, okay, nothing to do with it. So just, just, just to back up a little bit, the, the, um, uh, my, my first real project when I got deeply in, in, um, involved with Hello Wallet, uh, which was in the, in the summer of um, of two thousand nine. Uh, was you know Matt and I realized okay we're living off the Rockefeller money but we had um, a team of about eight people in place and um, and we knew we were going to be you know beginning to burn through a lot of cash and so my first project was to do a sort of a classic angel round and so I put together about a nine hundred fifty thousand um, dollar uh, investment round and which was really just a bunch of my former colleagues I mean, just people I I know and uh, you know some people who do investing on the side and. Uh, so I pulled that together, um, and then that gave us a little bit of breathing room. So then we could approach, um, uh, and the person we approached was Don Rainey at Grotech. Uh, it wasn't, it was not Steve Case. Don and uh, Steve they co-invest on a bunch of on a, on a bunch of things. So Matt and I first met with Don in um, uh, in December of 2009, uh, and we hadn't we hadn't launched our beta until we didn't launch our beta until March March 15th of, of 2010. So we still didn't have a beta out there. We had a lot, we had a lot of ideas. We were pretty good at talking, um, and um, and I was introduced to Don through a lawyer, <laughs> right? I mean, come no on. No surprise there. We're in DC, right? Yeah, you know, it was through a lawyer, uh, and it was Don who brought Steve in because Don and Steve they co-invest in a lot of different things. Now, the place we went with Steve, I think, what piqued his interest was the social mission because the initial investment was made through the Case Foundation, not through Revolution. And it was that, it was that very clear social mission focus that we had that was, I think, um, you know, sort of wrong, uh, sort of a particular. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, um, that's, that's actually, actually a very intriguing story because, I mean, when people think about Steve Case and, uh, you know, him investing with Revolution, it's always like, you know, it's done through, you know, internal channels, but it sounds like, you know, you went through the whole social mission. So that's 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 really yeah. great. I wanted to talk more about, um, you know, now we're talking about Don Rennie of Grotech. Like, I know that uh, T Savage is also on your board. Ty, no, oh, Ty, Ty, yeah. Ty, yeah. I mean, is he is he is he still active? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I so actually so I'm actually very interested with uh, with Ty, um, and and is he. How how has he been very helpful to Hell of Wallet? I mean, is, is this like, is this are you is this for your own account? No, <laughs> no. I mean, like, so I heard like Tig is very like uh, metrics, very mathematic kind of guy, numbers guy, and uh, and he kind of really drills it into you. So like, is that is that true? I mean, or is he more of like a soft kind of soft skill kind of guy, and you know, kind of you know, Philly kind of you know investment advisor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a fair question. Um, <laughs> you, you speak with some knowledge and you're not telling us everything. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, look, Tig is, um, Tig is great. And, and I mean, we, we're fortunate to have a great board. Uh, uh, you know, and it, it's, a, it's a quite a diverse board. Uh, the, the, um, you know, the, va the value that someone like Tig brings to us is, um, you're right, he is very sort of metrics oriented. Uh, there's a discipline uh, to his uh, thought process, um, and it, you know, I think it's it's um, 
you know, there's all, it's sort of uh, easy as when you're d deep into the startup to um, begin to think that uh, the wine that you are making is absolutely the best tasting stuff that's ever, ever been seen. And it's important to have somebody who kind of pulls you up and says, wait a minute, let's do a reality check and, you know, sort of like, let's test these assumptions and, uh, and, and, and you know, and just sort of the, that, the, the discipline of, of, of um, it, like, like, you know, having KPIs and having benchmarks and knowing, like, let's really carefully look at the progress you're making from, you know, month to month or week to week. Uh, you know, he's, that's, it's very, it's important and it's great. Uh, so how about Don? Does he does he have a different philosophy in startups? Well, D D Don is is definitely. I mean, they they're they're two different people, right? They they have different personalities. I, so. yeah. um, they, they, I would say D Don is is um, is a little bit. I'm going to say softer um, in his in his approach uh, than uh, than Ty. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So um, so what do you think is the future of Hello Wallet? And do you think? I mean. You know, I, I, you guys, you guys have kind of pivoted, right, uh, to more of an employee uh, benefit management. Like, how big of a market do you see that becoming? Well, so we we knew from the very beginning uh, that Hello Wallet was going to be an enterprise software company. We, we uh, and I know this is in one of your one of the questions you asked because there's always that sort of tension between pursuing a B two C versus a B two B. Uh, and and when, when I say B2B, it's really B2B to C, right? Because at the end of the day, we're just putting this piece of technology in front of a consumer, an individual. And the question is, what's the most efficient, effective way to acquire that relationship? How do you do that, right? Um, you know, you mentioned Mint. We're nothing like Mint. We're nothing like Mint. Not anymore. No, nothing. Um, so, so we... You know, we, we could be a pure B to B to C uh, and pay a lot of um, you know SEO, um, you know SEM, trying to acquire eyeballs. Uh, but the problem in terms of revenues is that what like what's the revenue model, and is it going to be advertising? Is it going to be like a, in, in the case of Mint, where they, it's bounty fee driven, right? Where they're going to say to you, you know, you need to go to J.P. Morgan Chase to get your Sapphire card, and Saf and J.P. Morgan Chase then writes a check to Mint for fifty bucks or seventy-five bucks, right? It's all about leads, product leads. Well, we decided because of our social mission uh, that we wanted to be completely agnostic, right, and independent of any financial institution. We wanted to be, think of us as like Switzerland. We, we want to be not aligned, which means, I mean, which kind of begs the question, well, then how, how do you get paid? Who's going to pay you, right? If you're not going to sell advertising, if you're not going to sell, if you're not going to get bounty fees, then how do you get paid? Uh, and so that immediately takes us to a subscription model, right? Subscription model. But the problem is that consumers um, have been pretty well trained to assume, expect that anything they need, they can get off the internet for free. Right? Or they think it's free, right? We can have a separate conversation, interesting conversation, debate about, you know, what, what, what's free, what, what does free mean? But, um, and you have literally, well, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of apps out there that speak to some kind of personal financial challenge, issues, problem solving, right? Help me find a mortgage, help me find, help me pay for my kids to go to college, help me get a credit card, help me, whatever it is, right? How to pay off my debt. Um, and, and, and of course those are all quote free, but they're not really free, but that, that's a hard battle to fight. So we immediately made the decision, the only way we're gonna be agnostic, independent, unbiased, is by going to employers and convincing an employer that they should pay for Hello Wallet because it's in their best interest and it's in their employee's best interest, right? So that's who's going to pay us, right? So th therein lies our B to B to C model. Now, the reason why it's a much bigger opportunity today than we realized back then is because in the beginning, we were just thinking of ourselves as personal financial management, right? PFM. We have come to realize that PFM is, and, and sort of my metaphor here is going to be, if you're driving down the highway and you're looking through your rear view mirror, um, and so as you see what, what's behind you, well, that's PFM. That's like, how did I spend my money? What did I spend my money on, right? You know, how do I categorize that? 
interesting stuff, but it doesn't really change outcomes. You look through the windshield, you look down the highway, and you are thinking about what's, what's in the future, what's coming up. How do, how do you link what, what you just drove, what, what just happened to what's coming up in the future is all about behavioral finance, behavioral economics, right? Active, de active design. There's some really very cool stuff that we're doing to change people's behavior around their money. Why does an employer care about this? The employer cares about this because, because if you're an employer, you're spending, well, I mean, the, in most, most of, certainly more than 50% of your, um, of your expense um, burden for any typical employer is their total rewards. It's what their the paychecks that they're, they're writing every week and all of the, all of the, uh, the benefits, health care, um, you know, retirement, you add it all up, right? It's a big number. The problem is that there's a dramatic misalignment between total reward spending and the needs of the population. And the reason for that is because employers don't really, A, know what's going on with their employees in terms of their personal financial situation. Um, and B, employers have a really hard time communicating the value of benefits. And, and, but when you think about benefits, whether it's health care or retirement or, um, or, or, your, or your paycheck, right, your paycheck, um, it, the, the, it, it's, just, it's a whole bunch of discrete financial decisions that somebody has to make. And it's even becoming a bigger bunch of financial decisions as we move into a consumer-driven health care world, right, where it's no longer you have a blank check, right, and somebody just is going to pay for your health care regardless of what happens to you, where you actually have to say, well, wait a minute, I only have, like, I have an HSA account. I've got to fund that account. I have to think about how do I use my FSA dollars. I have to think about how do I use my commuter dollars, right, and there's a pre-tax benefit to that. There's a lot of decision-making that has to take place. But going back to the basic problem is that most uh, people, most Americans, don't have the financial acumen, in, including, I'll put it in my hand, including myself, right, to figure this out on, on, you know, on, you know, on, on your own. And so you need a tool like this. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, um, it's kind of interesting how you say that because, you know, you, you kind of gone on to the enterprise route, <clears throat> you know, so the B to B to C. Um, and so, so it's kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of startups here, they, you know, there are a lot of consumer internet companies here, and then there's uh, startups who are thinking about, you know, enterprise. So, do you think that as a startup, I mean, and, and I'm sure you've you had the same kind of problem when you were first starting up, you know, do we have to pick and choose what strategy to pick? Like, can we go both? No. Yeah, you, you have to pick one or the other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, look, I mean, this I did look the mistake startups. All, always make, always, always, always make, is you, you take on more than you, more than you can manage, right? Keep it really simple. Um, keep it simple. Pursuing a enterprise and consumer channel at the same time is, uh, I mean, show me a single company that's done that successfully. Well, that's kind of interesting because, like, what, what's your opinion about, you know, um, Box and Yammer and Edmodo? I mean, they, so for example, like Edmodo, you know, they, first started out grassroots, right? It was all teachers. And then uh, a lot of teachers signed up and then they decided to hit the principles of the, of the schools. And yep. so that, you know, you know, clearly that they're more of going toward the enterprise, right? You know, school enterprise, if you want to say that. Um, do you think that that's almost kind of like a B to B to C or, you know, you know what I'm saying it's, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like a hybrid approach. And, and with, with Box, it was the same way where, um, they had a consumer bent to it, and then they decided, okay, let's go all enterprise. You know, they kind of like went all in that way. So well, I mean, look at look at Salesforce. I mean, you know, uh, Salesforce is moving really fast into as an enterprise company, right? But they didn't start in the enterprise, right? They were just a B to uh, you know a, a B to C application, and, and it was free, right? I mean, basically, it was free for everybody until they kind of got you hooked, and then they said, wait a minute, this is pretty cool, and now what are they doing there? Like they want to own the whole, you know, enterprise rec recruitment space. So I think I think you just have to I think you have to pick your channel. Uh, you know, we we are different. Well, I'm not going to say. Actually, there are some interesting adjacencies with somebody like a Salesforce.com. But you know, there are enterprise software companies, and when I say enterprise, I mean we're obviously talking about SaaS. We're not talking about on-premise, okay? But there are enterprise SaaS companies who are delivering a solution that is mission critical to the enterprise, 
right? That's mission critical of the enterprise, right? Workday, it's a lot of what they're doing, or Taleo, right? Or success factors, right? Um, what we're doing is not mission critical to the enterprise, right? It's like the company doesn't stop working if somebody doesn't tune, you know, use their Hello Wallet account, right? It, it, the, it's just that we, we're using the enterprise as our acquisition strategy, and we've figured out that there is really compelling ROI, hard ROI, to the enterprise of paying for Hello Wallet. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, I think, so one of the questions was, you know, when, when I sent you that list of uh, questions, um, the, what kind of message do you have to give to an enterprise um, to sell your product? Um, do you say, oh, we're going to reduce cost versus we're going to do lead gen? Um, do you think there's a fine line between that? I mean, you know, it's trying to create more revenues for an uh, enterprise versus, you know, a lot of enterprises are very cost driven, you know? And so what's your opinion about that? Well, okay, so you can either be in the business of helping generate revenues or helping take costs out of the business. Um, I'm not too sure. I, I'm not familiar with companies that do both of those things. Um, I mean, I'm sure they're out there, both. But but we're we're obviously not helping generate revenues for a company, right? right we're right. so f focus on the cost side. It, the, the, what what makes it easy for us? Getting back to total rewards, there are buckets where the money that's being spent, you know, huge amounts of money, 401k, right? Like match dollars, right? Would it surprise you to know that? Um, you know, a typical big box retailer um, that has a, you know, 80% of their employee population is hourly wage um, and offers a 401k plan and actually offers a match, right? Most big box retailers offer matches, right? Um, would it surprise you to know that um, anywhere from 50 to 75% of the people who leave their jobs working for that big box retailer, the first thing they do is they cash out their 401k. They, they cash it out. So you, you and you see yourself. Wait a minute. So the 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 employer was making all these match dollars to help people, right, fund their retirement. And somebody leaves their job. What do they do? They cash out. They pay a ten percent tax, right, because there's a tax for that. And they're. Um, do you yeah. know what they do with the money? <laughs> sure. They 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 uh, they pay to fix their car. They put a new roof on their house. They pay because they they couldn't uh, pay, you know pay for their kids' co college tuition. In fact, in fact, anecdotally, we know that there are people who leave their jobs so they can invade their 401k accounts. I mean, how's, how's that for completely idiotic behavior, right? So, so, so what's, what's the problem? The problem is that people don't have emergency savings. People don't have basic, everyday savings accounts, right? Well, that's the kind of thing we want to try and fix. Yeah. Um, let's, let's, let's go move on to uh, more of the domain ex expertise. Uh, let's talk about the IPOs you've done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we know you've done many IPOs. So, what would you say was the most interesting IPO? Maybe the most fun that you had? I mean, if there is a such thing. And what was probably the most difficult IPO you did? Um, wow. Well, so, yeah, there, look, I, um, many, many, many IPOs. Because remember, I was doing this, uh, I mean, starting in 1980. Uh, eight, uh, 87 through, uh, well, I, I mean, when I was running the capital markets desk, um, you know, through 2001, and that was, we were right up, going up to the bubble, right, I mean, through the bubble, and right down. Uh, I, you know, the, the um, I think the, the most gratifying IPO I did, uh, I was involved with, I should say I did, I was, I had the, you know, honor of being part of it, uh, because it's, it takes a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of effort. Um, was probably the um, um, for a company called Infosys uh, Technologies. Uh, Infosys is uh, the, the Microsoft of India. Of course, now it's a you know they employ 150,000 people and they've got about a 45, 50 billion dollar market cap. Uh, and I, I spent a lot of time in India because um, we were developing our technology practice um, into um, and this was you know, uh, leading up to Y2K. Uh, and, and India had developed the offshore um, uh, global delivery model, which was basically to allow U.S. multinationals to outsource big pieces of their IT spend and hire, you know, in engineers in places like Bangalore and, and um, you know, Mumbai 
to um, you know to do the work. And so I got to know uh, um, uh, Narayanan Murthy, uh, who was the, the founder and CEO of Infosys at the time. They had five thousand employees, and they were listed in, in India. Uh, uh, you know, they had a small market cap, um, and, but he 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 wanted he thought it was really important for his company to bring it to the U.S. And so, um, it, so I, my team we we ran the uh, um, the listing for Infosys and the fundraising in the U.S. Um, on, it was on, it was on on the Nasdaq exchange, and it was important because it was the first Indian company ever to list in the U.S. Uh, and so it was a, it was a big deal. It was a big deal, and uh, and it was very complex because we had to. Get all sorts of waivers from the SEC um, for everything from stock option structures and uh, you know uh, you know well, in terms of governance, board of directors, et cetera, et cetera, to to set this company up so they could actually do this. Uh, the other thing that was really surprising to me, that was sort of an eye, uh, I guess eye opening, is it was a very it was a very successful offering, um, but it was actually it was a little bit difficult to tell this to. So the the the, um, the the CEO was um, was so um, humble and understated that it really was a little bit off-putting to many of the U.S. not many but a number of the big U.S. institutional investors. And at this and and I, and, I, and it was sort of a stark contrast because you know we were taking like Jeff Bezos around right when he was doing when, you know when we took Amazon public and then you you had uh, you know you had Yahoo's IPO. Uh, you, you had some really big names and some really big egos, right? Big egos. And people, like in sort of the Silicon Valley, sort of they kind of dug that. It was kind of cool. And then you had Mr. Murthy who goes around and people would look at the prospectus and they'd say, Mr. Murthy, you pay yourself $40,000 a year. $40,000 a year. Aren't you, you're not greedy enough. Like, what? Like what's wrong with you, right? I mean, it, I mean, I actually think it probably cost him in the pricing because investors said you're not greedy enough. And Mr. Murthy looks at you know and says, I, "This is I'm, I'm not I'm not here to make money. I mean, I'm here to make make to build a company, right? I, this is not about me making money." Now, as it turns out, the guy's worth a couple billion dollars, right? Yeah, it's like it's like Microsoft with Bill Gates. He pays himself a dollar, you know, or something like that. And yeah. well, but like Mr. Murthy, I went to I went to visit his his house in. Um, Outside of Bangalore, and, and, and he's, you know, it's a one, it's a one bathroom, two bedroom house. It's high. like just you, you look at this guy. It's, you know, it reminds me of Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett's been living in the same house for fifty years or sixty years. And anyway, so. wow, that's awesome. I mean, and, that, and that's actually a, a, a good segue to our next question, which is, you know, flipping companies. So you know, nowadays it's like, you know, we talk about, you know, like entrepreneurs, and don't you think like a lot of these companies are kind of set up? To flip companies and make entrepreneurs rich. And what's your opinion about that? I don't. I don't know what. I don't really. I read your question and I just don't know how to respond to that because I. I don't. I. I don't think companies are just set up. I mean, sure, there are some companies that are set up to flip, but I think most companies are set up for all the right reasons and people really want to do good things. Um, I, you know, unfortunately, when you when you take venture money. You're making a pact with the devil, right? Because there is a, there's a, there has to be a liquidity event, right? There is a liquidity event, right? So is that is that a flip? I don't know. I, it's, you know, but 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 that's that's life. I mean, if you want to talk about flipping a company, I did an IPO, I can 1989 or 90, for a company called Rexine. It was a it was a commodity chemical company that was taken private in a leverage buyout, and before the LBO closed. They retained us to take, them, to take it public again. We took the damn thing public. We flipped it in less than eight weeks. And the LBO investors, they made about... Um, well, they were happy. Yeah, they made about $200 million in eight weeks, I mean, at the time that was considered, I mean, it was considered disgusting. So, so that's kind of interesting because, like, um, I mean, Wall Street, the movie, Gordon Gecko. And it's, you know, you've been on the capital market side and you've been on the startup side. So, you know, do you agree with, you know, the theme of the movie where, you know, uh, the father says, you know, it's, you know, it's about building companies and it's not about moving money here and there and, and making a quick dollar. I mean, what's, what's, what's your opinion on that? Do you, do you totally agree with that? Like, that it's about building companies? Well, I mean, he was, I mean, basically, you know, with the whole leverage buyout and, and basically they had a... Uh, lay off all their employees and make it as as lean as possible, and then sell it, you know, with sell it 
for a couple, you know, millions of dollars more. Um, but he's essentially flipping the company. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, the dad was like, you know, son, it's about, it's about building companies. It's about like, you know, like how we are here. We're, all, we're a bunch of founders and, you know, we're the ones who kind of you know, wake up in the middle of the night with, you know, sweaty, you know, faces and stuff and worry about tomorrow and really kind of doing the grind. So, I mean, do you think that's, I mean, do you agree with that? Like, yeah. it's not about flipping company, it's about no, growing. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's not. I, you know, you, if you, you can read some really, well, obviously you can read books by people like Jim Collins, you know, Built to Last and Good to Great, and, um, and, and uh, you know, how, how companies really are, that, that, you know, that you, know, you, you, you know the difference between a really great company and, a, and just a, an average company. Um, because it has a, you know, it's 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 you know, it's the culture, it's the it's the attitudes, it's the um, you know, you look at like that, you know, you you, do, uh, you look at someone like Ray Kroc, right? Well, I mean, when Ray Kroc was in San Bernardino, California, in what was it like, 1958? You know, and he was you know 42 years old. He had no money. He was selling multi-mix machines, and he pulled up in front of the restaurant that was owned by the McDonald brothers and he and, and and he saw these people lining up and he went in to sell his multi-mix machine and convinced them that you know they could make a better shape with his machine and then he went and he came back the next day and he watched them and watched the lines and he said damn I, I want to get into this program right and he convinced them to sell him to sell him the right to take McDonald's and actually turn it into a franchise you know, you read, read the story of, Ray, of, of his life. I mean, he's he, you know, 42, he starts that, and then he spent the, you know, his entire life. Look at Sam Walton, right? Sam Walton's the same, same kind of story. Um, I mean, these are people who, who, you know, went into it because they were passionate, because they really believed in it. That last thing in their mind is, you know, how am I going to flip this? How am I going to, you know, make a buck? Right, so that's actually a very uh, good segue to the next question. I mean, what makes a great founder, in your opinion? Like, it, you know... Our founders, heroes. You know, like what? What are some of the qualities of a of a great founder? Well, I you know I think it's it's um, there are obviously many books that have been written on this. Um, I I think it's a combination of um, there's got to be vision, right? Um, and founders, by the way, are oftentimes very lousy managers, right? Um, but there has to be a uh, um, you know a, a, there has to be a vision. Um, and there has to be a, a passion, right? Because if you don't, if you don't exude the passion, then you're not going to get everybody else to um, follow behind you. Uh, but there also has to be, I think, a uh, an ability to recognize what you do well and what you don't do well. And I think what gets a lot of founders in trouble is um, is they, they you know we all have blind spots. Right, and and then we just we, we, it's not possible that we can do all do everything well, and and you so you have to be able to acknowledge you know what you do well and what you don't do well, and then you've got to be able to um, get somebody to do what you don't do so well, and you've got to give that person the um, um, the the the, uh, the uh, authority and the accountability to do that, right? Because that's where also founders get into trouble is they hire people to do jobs, but they don't actually give them the the authority to do it. Um, yeah. do, you, do you think that's a, uh, I mean, I, I saw this recent article at the Forbes uh, magazine and it, it, it said um, top 10 jobs that attract psychopaths. And uh, number one was CEOs and founders. <laughs> and, then, and then I think number four was like a surgeon or something. And, and you know. How about professional football players? Oh, I, I'm not sure. Well, I think that's kind of far than but. Um, and then I think lawyers were number two. So, um, so, so, do you think like lawyers are psychopathic? I mean, I mean, um, founders are psychopathic. I, I think I think we're all psychopathic. I think I think I think we all suffer from some element of mental disease. <laughs> I mean, because it's more of like you know, you've you've seen that founder or that uh, that that entrepreneur who's very like controlling. I mean, do you think that that that's do you think that's a good quality to have where? You know, they're kind of. I, I think it's. I think it all depends. I don't think there's any one size fits all. I think it's a function of the, the you know, the, the industry, the, um, the, 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 the place and time, the other people who are involved. I mean, it's all about chemistry, right? What's that chemistry that works? And and recognizing that, um, uh, you know, you know, recognizing that, uh, you know, uh, 
the the um, sort of what what defines a company today, like the culture of a company today. Uh, you know, when it's when it's you know pre-revenue, maybe pre-product. Um, it, it's gonna you know things change. It evolves, right? The needs change. The the the, the um, you know the seats on the school bus need to need to sh need to move around. Uh, and, and that's a real challenge for any company is to be able to gracefully, you know, evolve and move people around and realize that, you know, like you were great doing this for at this stage of where we were, but now it's time to bring somebody else in. So, um, so we're kind of like running out of time. So one last question before we do Q&A. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> what do you think is the... Can you kind of comment on some of the mega trends of 2013? No. No? Okay, so we're going to go straight to Q&A. <laughs> no. I mean, you are the oracle here, so, I mean, all uh, yours on you. I no mega trends, no. Although I do think that, um, because this is uh, um, essential to Hello Wallet, I think this, uh, this area of, um, kind of this field of data and privacy, and, you know, what, what do you own? Um, about your behavior, right, in terms of how you surf and what you do on the internet or how you spend your money and, you know, because somebody's always kind of looking at you trying to figure out, you know, how can I take advantage of this person based upon what they're doing. So how we protect our privacy is, I think, super important. And empowering people to own the value of their behavior is is a really big deal. And so big data? Well, but it's more than behavior. just the big data. It's more than the, just the big data. It's like, what do you do with that data? And how do you make sure that people um, are in control of who sees it and how they see it and when they see it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what do you think about crowdfunding? I just kind of threw that out there. It's, it's a loaded question, but well, what do you think about that? A, there's a lot of uh, press about that just in the last uh, whatever 48 hours. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I, I look. I mean, I have a um, you know, crowdfunding is um, it, it, it's it's been around a long time. I mean, it's it has a kind of a sexy name now called crowdfunding, um, and it means different things to different people. Um, I mean, I remember back in 1999. Um, there was a company called um, uh, Backroad Capital, uh, which was de developed, it was started in the Bay Area as a way to uh, basically <coughs> democratize access to venture investments, right, for the millionaire next door. Because there was a small clique of big VCs in the, in the Valley who were controlling, right, access to all of the hot companies. And so a guy named Steve Pelletier said, wait a minute, if you're an accredited investor, why can't we create a, a technology platform that will allow any accredited investor to bid for, for venture deals? And back road, they raised a lot of money. They did a bunch of deals, got a lot of press, and then they blew up because the tech bu bubble busted, blew up, and there was, there was no business. Um, you know, you fast forward. And I, actually, I looked at doing a startup about six years ago called Silent Capital, which was with Steve Pelletier, which was a reincarnation of Backroad. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, we didn't do it. Um, but the you know when you, when you think about, I mean, there's there's the crowdfunding, which is you know looking for the um, uh, the blessing of the SEC to basically allow non-accredited investors to begin to. Speak invest their money in startups, right? I think that's kind of a stupid thing to do. Yeah, because I, I was going to, because, you know, Hello Wallet with the whole credit card industry and how you're, they were kind of giving, you know, middle class Americans fire that they, they didn't know how to use. So it sounds like, do you think, think that crowdfunding is going to kind of go with, be played with the same kind of well, problems? Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think most people have no business um, investing in startups. Right, because we all read about, oh, you know, the, the big success, and of course we all know that for every big success, there's a hundred total failures. 
So most people, it's, I mean, just go to Vegas, right? Go to Vegas. It's, it's like, it's easier, right? And, you heard it from Rip Rebel. <laughs> go to Vegas. And Southwest, they, you know, great deals on the flights out there. So, but, but I think crowdfunding in a, um, you know, in the context of allowing what, what I'll call, I mean, well, I mean, there's a legal definition for an accredited investor, right? It, it's not that high a hurdle, right? If you're an accredited investor, should you be allowed to invest in, uh, in, in VCs? Sure, why not? You know, and one of the cool things about what we were going to do at, 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 at Silent Capital was we had come up with a, with a reverse Dutch auction mechanism, right? So we could, so you, you, you as a, as a, you know, as an entrepreneur, you could post your, your, you know, your business plan and, and put it up for bid and through a reverse, a reverse Dutch auction mechanism, which we actually took from Bill Hambrecht um, because that's at his Open IPO. Uh, if you're familiar with Open IPO, uh, that was the genesis of that. Um, is is you know we could then find a you know equilibrium in the market between the, the you know between the, the, the supply and demand, uh, and that makes sense to me. I like that idea. Okay, great. Well, um, we're going to open up the floor for Q and A. So. Um, Okay, well, let's just uh, go around here. Um, uh, thanks, Rebel. Uh, uh, a quick question. Uh, well, I don't actually know how quick it is, but it's for, for, I have an organizational management question. Uh, your background, from what I gather, just has a lot of institute, like large institutional perspective, and you and your role involves a lot of, um, I guess, from a fi the financing part of being in a startup and all that stuff. But then there's just being in a startup, and I'm just curious. Going from large institution to startup, what are some of the things that surprised you from a management standpoint? And then, also curious, um, what types of things do you feel you learned uh, just from your background, being in a larger institution, that you found applicable to a startup that maybe uh, someone else who's who hasn't had that experience just might not think about? Okay. That's a few questions. Well, it's, it's, I mean, they're, they're, that, those are great questions, by the way, and and uh, because I, I've worked for, I mean, I worked at Bank of, you know, Bank of America, right? That's like working for the U.S. Army. Um, but I got to Bank of America through working for a little boutique investment bank called Montgomery Securities, which we sold to Nations Bank, which then merged with Bank of America. You know, so I, the company I joined was there were four thousand of us, and then I ended up retiring from a place that had one hundred and fifty thousand people. It's crazy. Um, uh, and then, of course, I go to a place like Hello Wallet, where you know initially there were three of us, and then eight of us, and now there are forty of us. And um, th a couple of thoughts. One is that um, um, you know, so big big companies, you know, are really are just um, amalgamations of um, you know population, you know, s small smaller groups, right? Because at the end of the day, it's all about it's all about a group. Um, uh, dynamics and um, and you know interconnectedness um, in terms of personal uh, relationships um, and and in, in, in a in a sense it doesn't I mean in a very sort of um, basic essential sense it's not that different big company versus small company what what's really different between the big company and the small company is that in a small company. Um, it's so much easier just to get stuff done, right? You can, like, you have an idea or you want to grab, you know, your team and sit down at a table and hash something out. Um, and when you're working at a really big company, that you find yourself with layers and, you know, there's always sort of layers of, of I'm going to call it bureaucracy. I mean, it's sort of it's a necessary evil because, um, you know, there's, well, it's a separate conversation, but it, it, it sort of it's necessary. Um, and so that kind of slows down the process and it becomes, and you find yourself, I think, in a bigger company, um, expending way too much time just sort of navigating internal, internal decision-making <laughs> processes versus at a small company where that sort of navigating the internal decision-making processes, you know, is, it can be very, very, you know, that can be a very small, um, small hurdle. And, it's, and, and, and so you can really allocate your time and your effort to focusing on what's really essential. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's go back here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so, okay. since um, one of the first awakenings to financial independence is when you go off to school and therefore you don't have an employer, is Hello Wallet working closely with students on, on kind of that realization? And is the CFB and the creation of that, is that something that is helpful to Hello Wallet? So, those are good, yeah. Um, 
we, we're not working with high school students. We'd like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. I mean, we just haven't really figured out how to do that in a very like to work with high school students. You know, you, you from your story, you said you guys started in 2000, I, I guess, eight, and you were, it was 2009, March 2009, before you had your beta up. How were you able to get to able to raise so much money and keep investors interested without having a beta up? Was it a different atmosphere then? Was it the social, um, the, the social, uh, you know, kind of your, your, uh, what's that? Yeah, the social cause, or what, what, what was the, the reason for uh, being able to entice so many investors? Well, okay. So the first important point here is that we that Matt was working at Brookings until late 2008. We incorporated Hello Wallet in October of 2008. Hired our first employee in January 2009. In fact, it was Steve Wendell. Some of you, I think, have been to one of the some of the events that we've had. He's our chief scientist. Uh, so hired Steve in uh, January 2009. So that's when the bank we had to start spending some money. In April, February, March, March, we got in March, April, we got the commitment from Rockefeller, right? So that gave us some breathing room right there, okay? Um, and then beginning in about uh, um, July, August, in August of 2009, I started reaching out to my network um, to say, okay, we don't have a beta yet, but we got Rockefeller on board, right? We got Bill Clinton saying, this is very cool what we're doing. Uh, we have some, we thought we had a pretty cool business plan, um, and th these are my friends, right? So I say, trust me, like, we're going we're gonna to make something happen here, all right? So, um, so that's what we did. Yeah. Okay, I think we have one, time for one more question. Uh, Hi, I think this is something that may apply to all startups, but particularly yours as you, both in your early stages and as you continue to evolve and you'll have more data on people, how do you basically um, balance the trade-off between like really easy revenue opportunities versus like maintaining true like to your core and your mission and your product um, and not you know selling off to yeah. like, credit unions and anybody else who don't want to target your demographic? Yeah. yeah, that's a really great question and it's something that we, um, we um, don't struggle with much anymore, but in the early going, we had a lot of really, uh, I'm going to say, healthy debates, healthy debates about, you know, should we, like, make an exception? Should we, you know, run down this path because there's a little bit of money at the end of it, um, even though it's going to divert us from what was really the plan? And... Um, I'm going to say that, almost without exception, when we allowed ourselves to be diverted, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. Uh, it, it's, it's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing, right? Um, it, it, because, well, for all the obvious reasons, right? Because you want that money. Um, you, you um, yeah, it's hard, but you really have to. I mean, my advice is you, you, you have to. The, 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 there's an there's a there's an opportunity cost to um, reaching for that you know that little bit of money on the ground, uh, which you don't appreciate, 
until you're into it. And one of the reasons why I think it's such, it's, it can be so um, uh, sort of toxic is because um, the first thing you do is you fool yourself into thinking, oh, but this is going to be simple. It never is. It never is simple, right? Like you can say to yourself, oh, but this is only going to take like three weeks out of my time, or it's going to take my product development team, you know, uh, you know, two, two, um, two sprints, and that's, that's, that's okay. We'll make up for it later. It won't. It'll take four sprints or six sprints. It takes, it always takes so much longer. And then you, spend, but then what happens is once you've invested the first three weeks or, 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 or month or month and a half, then you sort of say, well, now I'm kind of half pregnant. Like, what am I going to do? I mean, I can't, I can't pull the ripcord on that. I got, like, I got to keep going for that, right? And then it's like six weeks, and then eight weeks. It's no, it's just, it's, it, I, yeah, I, I can't think of a single instance where it, it worked out to um, our advantage or where I've been with a company. I've seen a situation where it was the right thing to do. So. Okay, great. Um, we always like to conclude with one last question. Uh -oh. We want the two. I can do two questions or one. So one, one question. Just one. Okay. So. Um, can I ask the question? <laughs> hey, as long as you can read it off here. <laughs> uh, who's your favorite superhero and why? Oh God. <laughs> this is probably the toughest question. Yeah, this is a tough one, and this is gonna. So, um, and you, you obviously you prepped me for this, and I told my I told my kids last weekend. I said, so if I give this answer to the superhero question, what are they gonna say? And 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 my daughter looked at me. She said, Daddy, do not do that. Don't do that. Um, but I have to do it. So I I, I um, um so my my favorite superhero is actually a French um, superhero. His name is Asterix. Anybody heard? Anybody heard of Asterix? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Asterix is, you know, he's a, he's this diminutive, incredibly cunning, um, masterful guy who's living in this one village in what's now Brittany that's not controlled by the Romans. Julius Caesar has conquered all the rest of Gaul and th this is this one little village is the remaining holdout and Asterix is this little guy who has this magic potion and this wonderful sense of humor and this incredible ability to get people to believe in him and to you know he he's always like the go-to person and anyway I've always been inspired by Asterix I think he's very cool well, Rebel, thank you for uh, our interview time. Thank you.